My guest today is uh, Daniel P. He's the founder of uh, Cottery Capital, a principal investments and corporate advisory firm based in Sydney, Australia. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Mick. How are you? Good. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, raising capital because I guess uh, it's one of the most exciting topics to talk about these days. Let's start with you sharing your uh, background um, all the way since graduating from uh, university. Oh, wow. Going back that far. Um, I did something a little bit different. Um, I actually embarked on what we call the cadetship with, um, with KPMG. So the typical program looked like uh, it's a, a two plus two program, right? So you do two years um, uh, working full time uh, with KPMG during the daytime. Uh, it was a really interesting experience. And then at nighttime, the evening, we'd scurry off at, um, you know, just, just, I don't know, four o'clock or something. And then we'd run to university for a six o'clock lecture for three hours to 9 p.m. and rinse and repeat. You do it again, um, again in the morning. So, so you know, we did that for two years. And then the last two years were, were great, right? Because we do full time, you need to try and finish the degree. So you added a three year degree to this in four years. But the beauty is that, you know, in the evenings, um, I mean, the last two years, um, sorry, during the summer breaks and the winter breaks, you would go back to work. So um, you, you, you had a job at the end of your uh, uh, cadetship and it was real world, uh, you know, you're, you're thrown straight in um, post high school. So that was the start of my, call it your corporate career or whatever. I didn't think of it in that way, but um, that's how it started. So anyway, so then I didn't stay there too long, actually. Um, the markets were really buoyant, right? This was, you know, just before 2000 and seven, if I recall correctly, um, just before the GFC, uh, an opportunity came up for me to, to join, um, to join Deutsche Bank, uh, investment bank, uh, doing equities. Um, so covering whole, whole bunch of different sectors, really broad, not very different type of organization to KPMG. Uh, but, but like I learned so much, right? I stayed there, I think about seven, seven odd years, um, progressing through. And then um, I was uh, asked to join another organization called Elliston Capital. Elliston Capital, it started off actually as a family office with a Packer family, well-known fa Australian family. So uh, again, I did quite a few number of um, years there. Uh, you know, again, really different experience, certainly to KPMG and certainly to, to, to Deutsche Bank. Um, in 2020, I started Coterie Capital uh, and you know, so what, what we, and I think you said at the beginning, so what we do is two, two main things. We, we help growth companies to raise capital. We help them do M and A with partnerships, go to market, uh, geographic expansion into areas like in, into Asia. Um, we also do invest ourselves too as principals, but also alongside some families, um, and sort of strategics, you know, where it makes sense, where we can all add value. So. It's a, it's a little interesting um, sort of thing we've, we've, we've had for only a few years now. We're very young, um, but we're having a good time. We're working with some incredibly smart, interesting people <clears throat> within Australia, but also, in, as I mentioned, um, in different parts of the world. Okay, now going back a bit, uh, what were the key lessons uh, from working uh, for Elestron Capital? Um, I think we managed a whole, a whole bunch of money. Right, like you know, it's it's the institutional um, LPs, right? So the burden of responsibility is is just so real, and so I think distilling that down, I think the the connection between risk and opportunity, you it's sort of you know imbibed in your brain, you know every minute that you're that you're there, right? And when I say there, I don't mean just between the, when you're in the office, as you know, we live clearly in a global market. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're managing Australian equities or you're managing equities in Singapore or whatever it is, events are global. Uh, you know, there's geopolitics on top of that as well. So you are always watching your risk and your, um, your risk in the fund, but ultimately you always think back to your client, and then the member, you know, these are super funds, right, um, as, as LPs. So that that's something you learn um, through experience, but that was something I've taken away uh, pretty heavily, you know, as an investment manager is, is, 
is, you know, everyone talks about risk management. I think it is true. And, you know, the fund that I was in was a, a very concentrated fund. So you think about that, you have multiple billions under management across a smaller number of positions. Um, each each movement uh, of the stocks you're responsible for are extremely meaningful, you know, to you. So that's something you learn. And I think, I think I'm better for it, you know, mm-hmm. having that respect for risk. It's, it's, you know, I think people have a romantic thing, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a asset manager, I'm a hedge fund manager, I'm a private equity here, I'm a venture capitalist, whatever it is. Um, and don't get me wrong, phenomenal careers. You know, it's, it's, it's one of, in my view, one of the most uh, dynamic uh, careers you can have because it's always moving. At the same time, you know, when you're managing a large, a vast uh, amount of capital, your appreciation of risk is really amplified. It's, it's, not, it's not all fun and games. It's, it's real. You know, it's other people's money. Why did you want to, to change? You said the experience was there, obviously, with the immense pressure. But uh, what was the aha moment for you that, okay, I should, I should move on? I think a few things. Um, I think there was a bit of a natural evolution as well. The, the great thing about managing vast amounts of money, um, especially with these types of funds that are quite prominent in Australia, is um, these are very large LPs they're managing money for. Um, the flip side is that the mandate is very strict. You, they've given you money for a certain things. So in, in our case, the, the fund I was in, Australian equities, highly concentrated positions, as I mentioned. Um, and that's fantastic. That's, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alpha generating product, uh, differentiated. The negative is um, clearly in terms of business interests, you know, I, I, the many things that I saw that I, um, opportunities I came across my desk through the network, which clearly would would not fit in the mandate. You know, um, the fact that there are a whole whole uh, array of opportunities in the private market, for instance, early stage companies, um, out, even outside Australia for that matter, right? Let's say for Asia again. Those opportunities came, phenomenal founders, uh, not that every opportunity is good, but there wasn't much I could do with those opportunities with the mandate that we had given that's just that's life and so the other point was that you know i've been working for i guess other organizations of varying sizes and styles for for my career um and i think uh it gets to a point also where some people um have that entrepreneurial spirit and maybe gene to want to do something themselves and so um that i think those factors combined sort of i wanted to do something a little bit different uh, maybe potentially very different, and certainly, um, you know, the follow my interests um, for the first time. That's what embarked, uh, I guess, on this journey down the entrepreneurial path in starting um, uh, starting Cobra Capital. Now, talking about the current environment and uh, raising capital, uh, it's it's very tough out there. Whether you are a in a VC world, whether you are a startup, whether you are a pouring uh, manufacturing business, whether you are a hardware company, uh, what are the biggest mistakes uh, you see people making uh, when raising capital at this market uh, conditions? So I think two categories. Category one is what I would say, things that you should be doing irrespective of the market conditions. And what I mean by that is being prepared, and we can go in detail on what that actually means, but being prepared understanding the fundraising um, game. Uh, and I use that because there is a, it, it's not something that people do every day, right? So you need to know the techniques and tactics in raising capital and how to do it efficiently and find the most optimal um, capital, capital structure for your business, depending on stage, style, jurisdiction, industry. I think the second part is as the market is tough, you then have an overlay. Right. And the overlay is that you need to do things a little bit differently. You need to f- look at things differently because it is challenging. What does that mean? So you need to do everything in bucket one, meaning you need to be prepared, right? You need to understand how it's done. But two is, I would argue, you need to be more tactical and more creative than you were in a bull market, in an environment where you can raise capital easily. You need to be creative, uh, a bit more open-minded. And I can give you examples of what, what that actually practically means, but also you need to be prepared in terms of having having a, a, a longer term view on your runway and how how much cash burn you've got left 
to go. So you think these things are quite obvious, but the truth of the matter is, you know, by nature, uh, people who start ventures themselves of all walks of life are generally happy to take risks in life. So it's not necessarily the case that they're always thinking about how much oxygen have I got left to live in my business, right? Um, whereas you speak to an accountant, that's that's all they're worried about. They're not worried about the upside. They're thinking about the downside the whole time, which is interesting, right? You know, my experience with KPMG versus, say, now, right? It's, it's sort of the opposite. But in a capital constraint environment, you have no choice but to think in those terms. So it is not to say that you don't aim for a, a big vision, and you should, and you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. But you understand that in a capital constraint environment, your runway is the only thing that matters really. Because you may have a big vision, but if you can't finance that vision, then you don't have the resources to grow or to even to, to, to be around to fulfill the mission. What does that mean? It means that if you think that you've got, you've got a certain number of months runway, let's say you've got 12 months, six months of capital left to go, right? You need to be thinking about raising capital and how you're going to do it and all that, not two months before the runway is about to hit, before it ends. You need to be thinking well ahead because it takes time to get things ready. It takes time to canvas relationships, ecosystems, finding the internal support of existing shells, what they want to do, you know. And then when I talked about being creative and being a bit tactical and finding the different types of capital, unfortunately, that is also a symptom of time. It's not like you can be creative in a very short, short amount of time. Of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. There are some people that can raise capital very easily. Um, I'd suggest in this environment, the average is not going to be that case. Therefore, you need to have these things in mind in this environment. So I would, I would consider it those two things. Always do part one anyway, it's compulsory. And part two is just a symptom of where we're at. Um, but I think, but I think you know, good business is still being funded. Um, but you need to be creative in how you do it. Uh, I would like to go maybe a bit in depth with the preparation part, because how I see uh, raising capital, the process in general is uh, you have to be, be prepared, but you have to be lucky. And uh, being lucky, what I mean is not receiving the capital you were raising, but uh, you get the time, someone willing to listen to you. And you better be prepared when you get this 10 minutes. When you get this two minutes, and some people give you 90 minutes, you, you need to be prepared. Uh, so this is how I see that. But uh, maybe we can go more in depth of what you mean by actually being prepared. I think what you just touched on, Mick, if you had to ask me, you know, if this, if you only had to choose one thing in being prepared, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head, mm. right? So let me, let me expand. If you by happen chance meet a phenomenal investor and that phenomenal could be, could be widely defined. It could be, it could be someone from a huge fund, which you didn't think you have access to. It could be someone from a small fund, but can make a decision quick, whatever it, it doesn't really matter. What I find is the biggest impediment to the, the prep piece is not so much what you classify as the, have you got the right materials in the data room? Have you got your legals? That of course is compulsory, it's non-negotiable. What I find is actually a big hurdle really early on, and we talk about the luck bit, you'd be amazed at how many pitches we receive from founders and the deck looks okay, and that varies a lot, right? Mm -hmm. let's say we get on Zoom. Let's say we get on Zoom, like in this forum, and I say, Mick, tell me what problem you're solving, point one. And point two, how does your venture, how does your business, how does your dream solve that problem? You'd be – now, it sounds so simple. Like how, how hard could it be? This, this founder, this team, that's all they've been doing for the last X months. How is literally saying like, what's your name? Where do you live? It shouldn't be that difficult. You'd be surprised. We've, we've, we've had, we've had, and this is where there's a journey here. It's evolution, right? There's a learning piece. Being prepared, I think, in a nutshell, is knowing what problem you're trying to solve. So knowing the problem first and how you specifically are going to address that problem. Some people would argue timing matters too, like the why now. Um, I, I think it is important. I think if you answer the first two, I think you're going to get a long way in terms of the conversation. And it's all about attention. You know, people are busy. People don't have, you know, long attention spans. Um, these funds are busy. And 
again, we can get into it later on, but they've got a lot on their plate at the moment. In in a difficult environment um, for capital, they're absolutely a flow on effects to funds. It should be obvious, right? Therefore, their attention span in assessing new opportunities, you, you got to have sympathy for these people, these investors, right? So if you're not clear cut about what you're trying to solve and the problem you're trying to solve and how you're going to do it and why you're the right team to do it, you can see why you're never going to get past even getting to the next hurdle of going in in depth of the business. You know, you won't capture the imagination. And and that part, I think, is that preparedness part doesn't sound difficult, but I think the pract the pra- I guess practicing that along, you know, with your with your advisors, with your um, obviously with your team, your shareholders, and whatnot. I think it's critical. It, it's funny because. Um... In the beginning, uh, I didn't really understand what we are trying to build as well by acquiring small one to five million revenue uh, niche businesses with a long history. Uh, It was just an idea on the paper. And when I had to share what we want to do, I couldn't really explain this. I was like, okay, here's the paper, go through this. But then when I was in the the process of raising capital, obviously I called and um, message to a lot of investors that I was sending you an email and few guys, few guys uh, started calling back, but on a, on a moment when I wasn't in the office, for example, one time I was uh, just uh, walking around uh, and then next time I was with my bicycle and uh, he called me and I, I just pick, picked up and, and I said, sorry, I'm not in the office. Is it fine uh, talking at the moment? He was like, yeah, sure. I don't need the presentation. Just tell me what you want to do. And from there, I got this lesson that I really need to know what I'm doing and this, and then I know what I, what I'm doing. But back then it was like, oh, okay, I don't have my presentation. I'm, I'm screwed, you know, but they didn't really care about the presentation. No, uh, again, uh, my experience has been absolutely that, you know, the more senior, uh, the, the investor or the other, the other counterparty, have you want to say it, the more, the more senior, the more experienced the other person is. I find the less reliance there is on you flipping through a prepared material. If you can't articulate what you're doing in a few sentences or, or why why you're doing it and how you're going to do it, um, I don't think the best presentation in the world is going to get you there. I think the, having, the best presentation in the world will get you the, I guess, potentially the attention to have the chat. But if they give you the chat, right, and you can't capture the imagination in the first few minutes quickly, I think the rest of the time you, you keep, you're leaving a lot on the table by not being not having those things succinct. Um, yeah, so I, I I agree with you. I think it comes with practice. It, I, by the way, I don't think you need to be naturally born with this. Some of these things are can be can be practiced, right? You can refine it over time, but you certainly don't want to be practicing on an, a real life investor. You want to be doing this on your side of the fence before you hit the money. You don't want to walk up to money without knowing what to do. You said something very interesting uh, last time we spoke, spoke and uh, about the capital raising opportunities. You said ideas are global, capital is global. Could you could you explain what you mean? Yeah, sure. It's it's something that we 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 made up uh, because we truly believe it. Uh, you know, our, we felt a bit sheepish in saying it. I think it's even on our website, but we felt sheepish because we thought it's just so obvious. But I'll, I'll tell you how we arrived at it. We, we genuinely, you know, Australia's a very isolated place, you know, you know, like a huge island, but, you know, like it's not, we're not in the centre of the world, right? Like, you know, you've got Northern Hemisphere and all the rest of it above us with, you know, large capital markets. But I think what we realised very quickly was it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter um, where you're located. Uh, let's dissect this in two prisms. Ideas in this day and age, in this day and age with technology, and all the forums that we're all on, and we share quite a few, your idea can be sourced from anywhere in the world. The, and so the talent and the human and the idea can be sourced from anywhere in the world. Capital markets equally couldn't care less where you are, couldn't care less. Now, of course, it's not completely free flowing. There's obviously, there are barriers. There are some barriers, right? Like some mandates can't travel overseas. My example with, uh, for example, Ellison, that you know, we, we obviously didn't have a mandate to invest. For example, with with you know companies, I don't know, uh, let's say for Africa, for you know for arguments. But so I'm not saying that you know. Oh well, hold on, you know, Daniel said that you know. No, what I am saying though is, I'd suggest more than ever, 
if if you have an idea which truly is is phenomenal, I think capital will find you, or shall I say, you can go find that capital. Uh, not saying it's easy, but I'm saying I don't think that a geographic barrier in of itself is is a um, is a game stopper. And I would I would say that's where I find that's where that's what we want to do more of, right? So, and 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 you know, for pause there, let's not worry about what we think. Let's 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 think about what has actually already happened with other people, and other funds, right? And we're capital. And the truth of the matter is, you can have Australian companies, you know, founded and uh, found locally here. They can list on the Australian Stock Exchange. They can list on the Nasdaq. In between that, of course, you can have investors from Asia. You can have investors, obviously, locally. You can have investors from the US, the UK. It doesn't. It, it is not. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. I think that should be an encouragement. It should be an encouragement because it means that you build something big, build something global, have a global vision. Um, and yes, we'll take networking, relationships, um, brute strength determination all, all the all the you know all those things of course so I'm not saying you know a to b oh no you said it's easy it's not of course it's not um but you'd be surprised at how many i guess call them channels now are open between different nodes of capital and ideas and it's actually both and the two are not necessarily in sync with each other at any given time you might have a phenomenal founder in a different jurisdiction let's say in Singapore, in Jakarta, in KL. And it's not apparently easy to f go, okay, immediately let's try and source our capital from outside our backyard. It's not the first thing you think of. In fact, home bias must is, is an issue. Of course it, it is. I would suggest that's the opportunity that if you can network your way or find a compelling reason, to, it's not just capital, Mick, it's also partnerships. It's also finding customers overseas. This is much bigger than just capital. I call it capital because that's sort of what we primarily focused on. But if you take a step, you know, back, it's actually bigger than that. It's bigger than that because, you know, you want global customers. You want to attack different regions. You should not be constrained by where you're domiciled in initially. That, that to me, has no bearing. That basically just says where you live. And even now, that's debatable. People, you know, hop around Airbnbs now. Um yeah, what do they call them? These little dorms where you, all these programs get together. This, I can't remember what it was. Um, it's too cool for me. But it, it is clearly, is clearly moving in that direction. No question. And I'll add something else onto that. I think what has accelerated is COVID. It's one of the few gifts that COVID has given us. The work from home phenomena, the nomads, the fact that you can do your job essentially anywhere, not for everything, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, they can. That's changed the game too. Ideas now are being forced to go global. You think about it. You, you know, Aussies do this a lot. You know, Aussies who who are living in Sydney, Melbourne, whatever it is normally, they spend a month in Bali uh, as an example. And then the other people in Bali at the same time, but from other countries doing their own digital nomad thing, and you can just imagine, just imagine for a second, they're in they're at this cafe, this this co-working, right? Just imagine for a second, they're there for the month, they bump into each other. What do you do? Hi, Mika, what are you? Oh, I'm actually from the Netherlands. Oh, what are you working on? Oh, wow. That that stuff, I'm sure it happened before COVID. All I'm saying is that acceleration's happened. And of course, the capital buckets, you know, capital, we can't constrain capital. Capital flows to where opportunities. We're, we're in a global capital market. So if you if you marry up global uh, ideas and humans obviously moving around with the ideas because they're now more fluid and capital already is fluid, you can, it's it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time. You know I think I think people sort of you know in a tough environment for capital raising sort of get very down, right? Um, understandable. It's understandable. You know six months, twelve months raising capital, you're fatigued. You you given up. You think I think just again this comes to creativity part. You know, doing the the same thing that everyone else is doing in raising capital may not get you the result you want. Do something different. Try something different. You know, think differently. You know, and it's a big world. So, you know, 
again, I know you don't have unlimited time to, to source it, but when you don't need to look for capital, build those bridges, those ecosystems, relationships globally, regionally first and globally. And I think you're going to have these moments of serendipity. I think you call it luck, call it serendipity. It's just, hey, the fact that we're on this call together, that's, I wouldn't say that's exactly a formula which is in a textbook here at university. In fact, this is, this is all new, right, for a lot of people. I think this is where it's going to go. And I think, I think the sharper founders have accidentally bumped into this through their journeys, and I think they're taking advantage of it. I think just following the same playbook of, oh, I've spoken to, you know, 15 investors in a certain city, although I all said my idea wasn't good. Oh, maybe my, my, my idea is really bad, Mick. I better shut down now. I better pivot. Well, is it your idea that's not good or is you not speaking to enough investors or the enough investors in different region, different type, stage, so on? I think there's truth in that. I see it. But it's not natural. It's not natural to think that the city you're in is not the city where you get capital from. Before talking a little bit about being creative in, in fundraising process, uh, capital is global. And what was funny, we, we just had this five-minute conversation uh, few days ago before before the call and you mentioned there are there are different markets there are singapore indonesia bali all those places are pretty much the same but i just uh, after the call with you i just called to my partner uh, have we spoken investors from indonesia no we haven't and the question is like why because the opportunity is here the capital is global there are people who are interested in, in, in what we do. They just don't know about us. They just probably don't know about this country. And, and uh, this is our job to, to do that. And it's, um, it, it really got me thinking. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, you mentioned being uh, creative and uh, maybe even a bit tactical when raising capital. But creative is is more more interesting uh, topic. What should one do, for example, uh, if you could say that, okay, these people are extremely creative when it comes to raising capital. What are a few examples maybe? Yeah, so uh, I think an obvious place to start would be where you source your capital from. I think, I think there's, a, I think there's a, a prescribed way that everyone thinks it has to be done. And I'm talking about for early stage tech-orientated companies. So this may not apply for a whole co, may not apply for certain things, but just – only because this, this one I'm very close to. I think it's fair to say that, and this is prolific in social media, if you have a tech orientated company uh, that has global ambitions, the only way to raise capital is through VC. I think that's, I think that's pretty fair to say. I don't think there's much, there shouldn't be much pushback. I think that's, that is the, that's the culture, okay? And let me be very clear, I think venture capital is phenomenal Phenomenal, you know, I've written a phenomenal um, source of capital. Uh, I can really take you to a level which is unimaginable for all, for all the reasons. But to say that it's the only way to finance a growth company, I think you, I think you're not being creative enough. So, well, if it's not a VC, well, what could it be? There, there are many, right? So, so outside a hard VC fun fund obviously there are things like you know the angels which you know about you know the accelerated programs etc so i still count that as sort of that sort of broader pool of capital which is trying to seek ultimately a vc type vehicle but the other pools of capital by the way which are large as well these are not small pools of capital which you know like oh is there enough capital to go around family offices a great example they're getting larger and larger and they're becoming more institutionalized I'll give you another one. Wealth management groups. Now, each country calls them differently. So I, I understand, I think in Europe, they call them, um, there's a different term for them, but we'll, let's call them wealth managers for now. So people, so 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 rich individuals who give their money to professional wealth planners, wealth managers to, to manage. The truth of the matter is their, their pool of capital is getting larger and larger because the baby boomers are accumulating unprecedented amounts of capital. They're not putting that all into equities. Some of them are. Some of it's going to equities. Not not all that will be. And in fact, I think the literature out there would suggest that 
a lot of these wealth managers recognize that a certain percentage of the capital allocation should um, go to alternative investments. And of course, within that, you have private equity, venture capital, et cetera. So are you accessing those pools of capital? That's, that's not strictly speaking venture capital. Now, yes, it is true that a wealth manager can allocate directly to venture capitalists and the venture capitalists then, so are, is this not the same pool of capital? Yes and no, so that will happen. You also have uh, wealth managers and larger ones, sophisticated ones and family officers that actually prefer direct exposure to the company. No question. We've seen it. It's, this is not, not guessing. And you think about why this trend, it's not, it's not, it may sound like it's not, um, uh, uh, not difficult to believe, but what, what, what has happened is that you think about the behavior of investors, of individual investors, I should say, you, you think about the behavior. I think back in the day, investing in shares was a very, you know, sort of, oh, we better speak to a professional, you gotta speak to a professional fund manager, they know what's best. But look at what happened during COVID, right? People are home and everyone was uh, investing, investing, but everyone was invested in, in equities, having a view on Microsoft, Apple, Bitcoin, right? So what's happened here? What's happened here? Each each person, each individual, let's start the basic unit. Each individual believes they've got a view and they're qualified to have a view on an investment directly, directly. No other manager, not to give me the money, but I want to buy Apple. So I'm going to buy Apple for almost free, no brokerage, right? So is it that hard to believe then that these individuals over time, not for everyone, but for some, go, yeah, not only do I want to buy Apple, because I've done that already, but I may want to invest in a private company that's a startup, that's earlier, scale up, hold co, whatever. I don't think that's um, something that's hard to believe. I think, I, think, I think the movement of capital as a trend, I think will go towards there. I think it'll take time, but I can see why at the margin people are doing it. And then wealth managers also need to access things which are very difficult to access, right? So if all you're doing is buying shares, that may be something that you want to do not a little bit less of. How I see all this, you mentioned the uh, venture funds, uh, different asset manage- uh, managers, uh, family offices, um, being a life learn, uh, lifelong uh, salesperson um, in sales as well. It's, it's B2B, B2C, but at the end of the day, I believe it's human to human. This guy run, uh, running a massive family office is a simple human being. And uh, next topic, may, what I would like to maybe cover is uh, events, simple events. Because on the events, you see people. You don't see the family office, VC, I don't know, some type of bank. You see people. Yeah. So yeah. when it comes to events, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Um, I'm glad you asked. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a piece, um, a very simple piece, not sophisticated, um, on uh, LinkedIn uh, a while ago now, when ChatGPT AI was was clearly getting everyone's attention. It went something along the lines of, "You, I'm not an expert in AI, but AI is going to disrupt a whole bunch. Already has. But I think the most important thing that I've taken away so far, and this could change, um, it can sound really obvious, right? But you can't disintermediate a human to human relationship with AI. You, you, it's not, it's just not possible. You can't, you can't replicate emotion. I don't think AI can replicate human emotions yet. So you can't synthesize a human emotion. Now, if that's true, there are big implications here, right? This is going to be the Delta. The Delta is going to be people have great interpersonal skills and the ability to build relationships. And if we go back to the comment earlier about having global ideas and global capital, a computer or AI can help you match things more efficiently, obviously. AI can speed that up. AI can speed that up. But when it comes down to the meeting, you're not, the, 
you're not interviewing, you're not meeting over Zoom with a computer. It's going to be human to human, from what I can tell. So the human to human is going to be the delta going forward. You know, capital, as a lot of people tell you, it's a commodity, right? Ideas, hopefully, will not be a commodity, but I think capital is a commodity. Therefore, to differentiate, you have to have a great idea, but then the human behind the idea needs to be able to articulate, as we said earlier, right? And this is where events comes in. I think that's going to be the huge delta with the humans at scale. You have a gathering of humans, you're sharing ideas, not just ideas for the sake of it, you're sharing ideas, you're celebrating wins, commiserating losses. And I think that's where events are going to be super powerful because you can't, you can't disrupt that. I can't see how you're going to do it. So if you want to be differentiated, it should follow that you should do more of in-person type events, jumping on a plane, seeing people, shaking a hand, whatever it is, going to a function. I think those pe- those people and those ecosystems are going to outperform. It may not be financial. I'm saying they can outperform in their idea generation. They can have more influence over things because more people will be commoditized. If, you, if you're going down just having things which are not human related and everything's spread out and dispersed, I, I think that's where you're going to be at disadvantage. So I think to, to answer your question directly, I think events, um, I think the way that you've, you're describing it, um, I think it's going to be huge, uh, as in more so, than, more so than we've known in the past, which is a bit counterintuitive to the whole COVID thing. You know, well, let's just dial in on Zoom. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you can't you can't replicate. Zoom's not going to replicate what you do with those events and, who, and the, the opportunities. I think you know. I don't know how often you go, but it's very rare that I go to one of these events and go. You know, oh, I wish I wasn't here. This is a waste of time. It's 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 rare. You're always going to find something interesting. And again, it's not just for the purpose of capital making um, an investment decision. It's it's meeting people with different ideas just broadly about life. So I think I think that's where events will absolutely be a differentiator going forward. You know, in fact, I think those businesses are ones that um, investors should be actually looking at. You know, and I think they are. I don't think that's necessarily new, but I think the paradigm post COVID I think has amplified that in my view. Six seven years ago, I was living in in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, I didn't know what I don't know. So what I did, uh, I really wanted to meet those uh, wealthy individuals, and I just. Uh, Googled the most expensive street in Melbourne, and it was uh, St. George Road in, in Turak. It's a very expensive area. And I went there knocking on the doors. I met some people. I got, uh, I got what I wanted. I got my first idea of starting this uh, real estate business. But uh, what was more interesting, uh, every time I went there, I took a, I took a tram, and I saw there is a, this uh, coffee store. And uh, I decided to go there. I spoke with the owner just to, just to build a rapport. Uh, People really open compared to Northern Europe. They ask from you, hey, where are you from? What are you doing here? And this guy was uh, from uh, Greece and um, it was his small family business, a coffee store. And I started going there. And it was uh, very interesting because it was in a wealthy suburb. Uh, I started seeing uh, very expensive cars. And uh, I didn't mind back then. I just went there. Uh, the guy was sitting having a coffee there. I, I just went there. I, Hey, my name is Mick. As you can see, this place is super crowded. Would it be fine if I just sit here and have a chat? Guys were like, okay, sure. And I met some fascinating people. I mean, there were lawyers making five, six, seven thousand uh, dollars, Australian dollars an hour, having conversations with them. There were some uh, business owners. And one guy told me something, uh, which I still remember very well. Uh, he had a, a nice car, a Ferrari, red Ferrari. And I said like, whoa, that's a nice car. And he said that uh, he has few of those. There are two reasons. Number one, they're nice to drive around. But number two, the events. The Fer- Ferrari people, they have some type of events, I don't know, quarterly, twice a year. And he said that uh, a Toyota and the Skoda, uh, Skoda will never take you those, to those events. And this was... Uh, this was my lesson that, okay, you want to just, if you want to get around those people, this is one thing you can do. I can't afford a, afford a Ferrari at this stage. So I'm just super open sharing my ideas and thoughts on Twitter. And now I'm having this call with you 
which otherwise I think would not be would not be possible. And uh, that's fascinating. Right. But again, it's humans to humans and uh, crazy. And just just on that point about the Ferrari Club, right? I think you know there might be some misconception. Some people think you know networking and these clubs it's all exclusive. You have to be extremely wealthy to be part of these clubs. And yeah, Ferrari Club, of course. Yeah, sure. I don't think a network is also what it used to be. I think it's evolved. You know, it used to be like a private members club and more elite. They still exist. You know, I'm sure they add value to, you know, the members. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. Just because you're not one of the part of those clubs or you have enough money to be one of those clubs or you don't want to be in those clubs, it doesn't mean that you don't have your own club or your own network or your own event. Host your own. You you know, I think, I think this is where, again, I think things have been more... Yeah, I'm not sure if it's post-COVID, but I, I suspect it could be part of the driver. So I think the world's moved on. You know, I don't think clubs have to be formal for the network. And and I don't think a club has to be a physical space. You know, like <clears throat> attending, you know, I was at a function in Jakarta in uh, March was, right? And it was just just phenomenal. We had people, albeit mostly South um, Southeast Asia, uh, they flew in from... Uh, you know, a whole, whole bunch from Singapore, KL as well, I think, flew in. Um, I saw um, a few people from um, from Vietnam as well. It was a, it was a VC type um, gathering, right? But it doesn't matter. Like, we're in Chicago, but it doesn't matter um, wh- where the location was. The point is, we all had a common sort of broad interest, obviously, in early stage investing um, in the region. And you meet phenomenal people doing all sorts of different things, business models which may not be that accustomed to in a city like Sydney, as an example, um, because it's a different demographic, different stage of economy, small, small population, of course, but you learn ideas, you meet people, and that's I think that's where the world's going to go. You know, it does, it, this, is not, this is not a physical club. The venue could have been anywhere. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. And, and then you throw in things like, you know, there's co-working type uh, concept as well. So even more so, yeah, physically you meet somewhere, but that's not even a place that's permanent. It's temporary. It can be located by hitting a button on subscribe. So networks, I feel, are more important than, than any time. But I think the formulation of the network is less formal than any time, which means that you need to, you know, to go to these events or the network you need to be a little bit more creative family office guy on on twitter said something very interesting i didn't know about this but they sometimes do just a sm- tiny small investment into a specific fund or in a specific person or their idea even though they could invest five million they only invest twenty five thousand dollars why because they want to see and get to know this person like how often do they give uh, reports how is it working with yes. them? All those things. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, giving monthly or quarterly uh, overviews, reviews, how important you see it is. Because there is a, one, one small interesting story as well. There is a guy called uh, Harry Stebbings. He runs a, a massive uh, VC podcast. 20 VC, uh, right? 20 VC. Sure, exactly. And he said that he at one stage has had like uh, 39 investments and only eight we're giving uh, monthly or quarterly reviews uh, and it's extremely surprising. Uh, what have yeah. you seen and what are your thoughts about this? I think the obvious one, the obvious one is that, you know, when things are tougher, when the economy is a bit tougher, certainly capital is tougher, you need to over communicate. You know, you need, you need to be regular with your investors. It's, it's their money. You're a custodian. You're a steward of their money. This is not the time to be, hiding or to be silent on how things are going. Now, I understand the counter argument. The counter argument is going to be, we're really busy. We're trying to put out fires. We don't have time for, you know, reporting. You know, my argument would be, you know, I think the frequency does matter. You need to be updated, right? Now, look, I'm not, I'm, I have no firm view whether it has to be monthly versus quarterly, but you, it can't be like, you know, you hear from the guy once a year, right? I don't, I don't think that's right. 
Um, but equally, I've seen, I've seen, Mick, I've seen different versions of communication, right, from two types. One, we are, we also have investments ourselves, as in we are the investment managers for investments. Um, you know, personally, I have investments as well where I, I'm an LP. Uh, and then equally, I have guys that have come, um, they, they're not looking for capital at the moment, but they want to sort of stay engaged and they want to uh, bring us on the journey. So they, we, they put us onto their mailing list, their, their newsletters, right? So we see a whole bunch, a whole range. And I don't mind. I, I like it, right? I, t- I tell you, I mean, the, some people do it much better than others, right? And, and the secret is it need not be lengthy. And if I would argue if it's too long, people aren't going to read it. You know, it's like what went well, what hasn't done well, and what are some things, some asks? How, how can my network, if you can, how can you help me as a founder? And you'd be surprised. I've clicked on the, you know, the, the bit. Sometimes I've clicked on the bit saying, um, you know, I can't help uh, directly, but, hey, I might know someone that, that you should just meet or that might be interested in helping you in a certain thing. But if there's no communication, I don't know what you're asking. Like, you gotta, you gotta tell, you gotta tell your supporters. Um, by the way, the supporters, right? You gotta tell them what you need. And I, I understand why they wouldn't, because I guess if things are going really bad, you want to keep saying, "Oh, you know, things are going really, really bad." Or uh, <laughs> it's their money. You need to report on what's going on. It need not be that formal, like each month, you know, quarterly. You know, there are formal reports, obviously, for you know, financial disclosures. Somewhat, I'm talking about just bite-sized information about how we're going. You know. That, that, I think, is actually a benefit. Don't think of it as reporting. I think it's a benefit to the founders. Absolute benefit because people can help you. People can support you. You never know who they're going to forward that email to. You, never, you just, you, you, can't, you can't forecast how things come up. But one thing's for sure is there's no attention being driven out. There's no way someone's going to know how to help you, even, even if they wanted to. So that's why I think it's actually in your benefit. It's a little bit of extra work. I, I'm not convinced it's a work issue. I think people don't want to say how tough things are going, but people know things are tough, generally speaking, you know, not everyone, but generally speaking. So I think that's okay, but ask for help, you know, and also, but equally, you know, if you've done something phenomenal, shout it out. It can be small for you, but you know what? If people have been supporting you. Sh- financially or otherwise, they want to celebrate with you because it's they're, they're emotionally connected to the business, um, if not financially. So give give them give them the ammo to, to celebrate and um, tell their network about what's happening and you just don't know. I have I've I've seen it personally. It opportunities come up. It's it's just I I, th- I think I think you're doing yourself a disservice by not doing it. Australian market and the culture in general isn't much different from Europe or US. That's that's my experience. I've been living there for a few years. It's not that different. But uh, building uh, relationships is often a crucial aspect of, of fundraising. So how do you go about uh, cultivating meaningful connections with potential investors in Asian markets? Because again, this is a, honestly a wild, wild west for me and I'm sure many listeners. Uh, what should one know when uh, when wanting to working together with Asians, raising capital for them? What should one know? I think the first point to make is that the markets are very different. I, I mean that through the lens of cultural difference, right? So, I mean, I'm not talking about language difference. Let's assume that everyone's speaking the same language, some somewhat, right? Culturally, it's just so different. So, what does that mean? You need to even go, I guess, harder uh, or differently uh, and, and prosecute the case for longer to develop trust. And trust is, trust is it. You know, you talk about human to humans, that, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's trust. I, I would almost argue that some of these networks are very closed shop compared to, especially in the US. I mean, that's probably the polar opposite. But my experience has been, if you can show the value that you can add, they might have to like you as a person, Obviously, that's that's the emotional part, right? That's the kind of, that's a human to human emotion part. If they like what you're trying to do, if they like you as a person, one door opens, and then they introduce you into 
then at work, and things go from there. And then if you if you flip it, it also means that once you're in the circle, or at least one of these circles, you instead of one to one relationship, it's like you're in the relationship to one person, but then it opens up ten doors. That's a multiplier because the thing was closed. The network is somewhat closed anyway to start with, right? So once you're in, you're in. So that that that's all concept. Um, that's that's what I found. Uh, but you need to put in the time, Nick, and the effort. It's not, I, I love it and, and you know, obviously, you know, Asian heritage and, and I live in Sydney, so flight, you know, eight hours, nine hours, um, you're, in, you're in Southeast Asia, right? So, but yeah, I understand if you're in New York and I don't know, if you're in London, it may not be the most obvious, joyous place that you immediately think of given the distance, right? If you are wanting to, it's not something that's easily accessible unless you really want to do it. So I say you got to work at it because it's worth doing, you know, and it's, you bang your head going, oh, this is, this is really difficult. I don't know. It just takes time, you know, and you got to work on the ecosystem as we discussed, but uh, it's, it's seriously worth doing. That's, that's my, I can testify to that. So the opportunity is there big time. So one, one should just, uh, for example, in our case, we should, we should just book a few meetings and we should fly to Beijing, right? Depends what you want to do, Nick. Like, you know, uh, so again, but oh, okay. So this, this is the other point I'd make. It's pretty well known, maybe from um, our perspective being in Australia, but maybe not, like to, to, when we say, you know, you want to go to Asia, I mean, Asia is, that concept is, that's, that's name. You know, it's very different. Like, you know, uh, Beijing, Hong Kong look very different to Jakarta, which looks different to, Vietnam, parts of Vietnam, um, okay. like it, 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 every every city is is to say that oh we're going to Asia. That's a very yeah you need to call. I I'd suggest if everyone says we're going to Asia, like we're expanding in Asia. You call them out and say you know define which part of Asia. Like it's it's easy to say we're going to Asia. Which part? It's 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 very different, entirely different. I'd argue each culture is so different too. But again, that's that's interesting. That's the most exciting part, right? Because it's so hard to figure out how to attack the region because it's so different. You know, I, I, I don't know for sure. I think fold outreach it's doable. I think it's just a, I think it's a little bit harder. But I, I think warm introductions, in my experience, has has helped more than cold outreach. And I think the question my view with what you're trying to build, I think the first question we come up with is not what you're trying to do specifically in terms of hold co. Why, why would an Asian investor allocate to the hold co centered in the Northern hemisphere? Or is it that you want to bring your concept to Asia? That, that sort of paradigm I think would come up pretty quickly in the conversation. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I'm saying they'll be curious. Like, wh why, why did you come here for capital? Or, or is it something we can help you with? And that's, that's a whole other conversation because, as you know, the large organizations in some of these countries, frankly, are not um, – they actually are holding companies themselves. We call them conglomerates, but holding companies slash conglomerates. So what you're building in a way, it's actually not – in some some countries might be like, whole co, you know – doesn't sound very, but in Asia, it's it's very you know you have these ex extremely significant families with extremely diverse operations. You might start off as a coal mining, small coal mining concern. Then you've got capital. You go, hey, I think you know I want in hard assets like you know mining. Um, and sorry, sorry, in, in, in property. And then you go, well, hold on. If I've got you know, <clears throat> if I've got buildings uh, with a lot of space. Oh gee, you know, why don't we start like a supermarket chain because we've got the land and the building anyway? And then you go, oh, if I've got a supermarket chain, um, well, gee, could we do the logistics to help our own grocery chain and also make uh, some money for um, for logistics for third parties? Yeah, we could do that too. So you end up with these mega conglomerates spanning multiple industries. 
So the concept of whole code for them, funnily enough, may not be that foreign. You're early stage, but the concept's on be like, why would I give this guy money for him to buy random businesses for him? So, yeah. The message has to be clear. Let's put it in this way. Crystal clear, because if you're, if you're not clear, they can't be clear how they can assess the investment. Then you've got cultural overlay being, this is, I guess, anywhere, but, but, it, but, but it's not even Asia. It, if I randomly flew to New York and said, this is what I'm trying to do, but not, not clearly, you know, let's have a meeting. How much time is that guy going to give me? Like, not, not, like maybe once and then never again. That's, that's the thing. So whether you're, whether you're trying to build something in Asia or anywhere else it has to be clear. Why, why do you need us? What, what would you like from us? But money, of course, but, but, but why us? What, why didn't you go elsewhere? Why, why have you flown here to see us? You know, and then of course, what are you trying to achieve? Daniel, it's been uh, really awesome uh, talking to you. Honestly, from my side, it's been like talking with an old friend about uh, raising capital and all those stories. Uh, let's wrap up with the uh, famous five. Uh, how old are you? 38. Favorite book? Well, actually, one that would be, I think, relevant to our conversation at least is uh, one of my all-time um, oh, heroes, I guess you could call it. And you can probably guess if I said private equity hero. So Steve Schwartzman, founder of Blackstone. I think his book, what it takes, what it takes. Yeah, what it takes. Um, I, that's, it, it's it's a good read. It's an easy read, but the, it's, it's not about the, the stories in it. You know, there's one that I'm going to get awfully wrong paraphrasing. So forgive me, but... I will not forget the story and I've told it many times because it's just sunk into me and um, it means a lot to me, uh, even though I've never met Stephen. It's when he started Blackstone and, you know, super successful banker, ex Lehman's, thinking that, okay, we've, we've announced we're starting a fund. Great, let's raise some LP. So they went to one of the endowments. I think it was Harvard endowment and he went with his business partner um, and um, they went outside the office to the to the, the investment CIO or you know, whoever the allocator was and um, he's looking at his watch knocked on the door no one opened and he was waiting there for like I don't know 40 minutes a long a long time and then a janitor walked up and he's and and then I think Steve asked the janitor is 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 this whoever, Bob whoever, is he, is he here? Oh, no, no, he's, he's not in today or he, he, he left hours ago. I th and so I think the story goes, but we had a, we had a booked meeting. We, we, we flew all the way out to Boston, who was Harvard, to see this guy. We're here to talk about an allocation to Blackstone. And I remember him then walking towards um, the cab rank to try and find um, transport to get back to the hotel or whatever or to the airport. And just started pouring down, like torrential rain. And he, he didn't have an umbrella. He wasn't prepared. Um, and he was holding like this newspaper to try and New York Times to try and cover his head. And I just remember the things you must do, the, how hard it is to start a new business, point one. Point two, just doing something different uh, is just so, so, so hard. But, but look at him now. He's... Blackstone's world's largest public equity manager. I will add one, di one thing in here. I think the founder was 15, 20 years older of, of, of Stephen, a respected guy in the industry. And he told him, said, right? yeah, and he told him that night, don't do it ever again to me. No, you know this story already. Yeah, don't do that to me ever again. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Married single kids? Married four kids. What's the best investment advice you've ever got? I mean, the, the most obvious one, I think maybe it's too obvious. You got to know your downside. You know, I think this, I think I'm paraphrasing Howard Marks. Um, you know, worry about your downside. The upside takes care of itself. You know, I think people are so obsessed about how big it could be. That, that, that's, that's of course interesting to any investor, you know, but you know, 
if you're not around to, to achieve that dream, what's the point? Yeah, it's a bad investment. You got to know the downside. It comes, you know, risk management. It comes all, all the all those things which we all know. Um, I always start off with how bad how bad could this be, and what's the probability attached to that occurring. Um, I think Howard Marks does talk about that actually. You know, um, and he talks about again I'm paraphrasing, but the analogy of um, a parachute. Um, uh, what do you call it? Sky, skydiving, skydiving, right? Like, if it goes wrong, the outcome is literally like it's a zero. So, I, th- I think what he meant, I think what he's trying to say there is that there are certain bets which it doesn't matter how good the upside is, the adrenaline and the rush, whatever it is, because the downside is so severe, you're better off just not taking that bet. So, it's all about, for me, it's all about risk. And, you know, um, that's not for everyone in terms of, you know, some, some investors. You just you have to look at the upside more than the downside. You know, just you have to, right? That's but but I think you know when we're managing other people's money, certainly with our own you know capital as well, um, I, I worry more about the downside. Perfect. Uh, where can uh, people find you? DMs. Um, why, why don't we drop them in the um, in the in the link uh, uh, below, depending on where you lift it. But uh, LinkedIn, um, Twitter X, yeah, shoot me DM. Perfect. Uh, Thanks a lot, Daniel. It was really great talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for hosting.